myself, Penny Cumberland. <laughs> so we sit within the ACT government um, and we deliver a lot of Commonwealth government programs. And um, this one today in particular is the Future Drought Fund Farm Business Resilience Program, which we've been delivering since 2022. And um, it's been very successful. And um, thanks to COVID, we did have to change our delivery mode and webinars was one of the outcomes. And we've actually ended up quite enjoying it. <laughs> so um, I just do want to acknowledge the Future Drought Fund for all their uh, contribution to the program. And also, um, I'm on Ngunnawal land here in the ACT. So um, I acknowledge the Ngunnawal people as traditional custodians of the ACT and recognise any other people and families uh, with connection to the lands of this amazing country that we all live in and the ACT region. Um, I acknowledge and respect their continuing culture um, and the contribution they make to, to the lands and the city that we live in. So you all are coming from other parts of Australia and um, I acknowledge all those other traditional custodians as well. So I don't think I've missed anything. Um, Mary, if I have anything important, pipe up now. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I'll hand over to Kim, uh, Kim Deans, I'll, lovely Kim Deans. I'll just, say, I'll just say, Jenny, um, just so everybody knows, we're recording. So um, uh, just just so you're aware. Thanks. Great. Awesome, Jared. Um, yep, we've got the lovely Kim Deans from Reinventing Agriculture. Um, we've done a number of webinars with her and today she's going to talk to us about um, weeds, which we've all got, whether you like it or not. <laughs> so I'll hand over to Kim, um, but please, any questions, pop them in the chat function in the toolbar. Thanks, Kim. Thank you so much. And look, I'm really excited to be here sharing with you all today. I'm based up near Inverell in northern inland New South Wales. Um, I, I'm on Anawan country, very close to Camilleroy country. And yeah, it's I'm sure there's people from all over the place today on the call. So we'll all have different weeds and we'll probably all have different names for the same weeds. It can get interesting, but it's a topic that I'm really excited to see the level of interest we've had in this webinar about. Because when I first started exploring this, it was a bit weird. And I still have farming family who think I'm a bit odd that I think like this. <laughs> but I think more of us are getting curious about it. And, and that's the, the spirit I want to infuse today with is curiosity and exploration. Um, I describe myself as a pretty holistic agricultural professional. And my whole thing is working with people who are ready to turn challenges into opportunities. And weeds are definitely a challenge. And there are opportunities there for us to do things differently or get to understand the problem more deeply. So that. That's a bit about me. I might share my screen and start working through the presentation. I've done my best to try and keep it to the core. So we've only got an hour. I could talk about this all day um, and hopefully have a few minutes for some questions at the end. So I'm just going to set up my screen. Hopefully you can see that there. How am I going, Jenny? Is that look yep. good? You've yep. got yep. my that slides looks... there? We have got them. Yep, you're good yep. to go. Because once I hit play, I can't see much other than my presentation. No. <laughs> it gets a bit disorienting. I see all your faces. Um, so, yeah, we're going to talk about weeds as indicators of soil health today. And um, thinking about, you know, as a bit of context, every year billions of dollars is spent on herbicides to control weeds. And these rates of herbicides and costs continue to increase each year. So the whole thing we're going to get curious about today is taking a more integrated holistic approach that can bring us a number of benefits you know whether they're financial ecological or regarding human health those benefits are there um, and it's not that herbicides don't serve as a tool in the toolbox but we start to think and look more integrated ways and holistic ways and start to question into why is this plant turning up here for us and open the door to different opportunities um, I want to just start by saying this is you know, I'm going to be sharing my experiences, things that I've been learning about um, on my own land restoration journey and also the work I do in other contexts with clients. Um, it's not intended to be one size fits all advice or prescriptive. It's really about principles, observations, and I really encourage you to think about how this applies in your personal context. Stay curious and stay flexible and think about ways you can be adaptable when you think about the principles we talk about today. 
Um, yeah, and, you know, your decisions around weeds are your responsibility and there's also legal requirements that we often have to consider around specific plants in our area. So, you know, keep all that in mind and also keep in mind that sometimes things take time when we start to change the way we approach something. It can take time and there's not always a quick fix. Sometimes we do see quick responses, but, you know, sometimes we have to commit to changes in our practices for a little while to see the results we want. So keep all that in mind as we talk through today. And one of the things I probably skipped on through as I'm launching into this, and I'm going to just jump back, is what we're going to talk about. So we're going to look at taking a different perspective on the plants we call weeds. Why do they grow? What are these plants turning up for? Is there an um, indication of soil or ecosystem health that we can learn from this plant? We'll hopefully touch on a little bit of time at the end for some alternative management strategies and hopefully a bit of time about a few local plants that you know, in your area in the ACT that might come up as well. So hopefully we'll get through all the main bits and have a bit of time for that um, as we go. But I'd love you to put in the chat box, um, you know, and I'll come back to that at the end. What do you think when I say weeds are? What are weeds to you? What do they represent? How do you define what a weed is? It's a really interesting question, isn't it? I was taught, probably lifelong had that whole thing, plants, weeds are plants growing in the wrong place. And, and I remember learning that at school and, and through my life, that was kind of what I saw the definition was. But I'm now learning that these plants aren't necessarily in the wrong place after oil. They're probably more plants growing where we don't want them. And I think today after we, you listen to some of my observations, you might get where that perspective is coming from. But, yeah, do feel free to put your definition of a weed in the chat. You might have a really cool one to share that we'll come back to at the end when we do the questions. Um but one of the things I guess I often ask groups when I talk about weeds is how we, you know, think about how we react to weeds in our landscapes. You know, what's the ingrained first reaction? And it's generally, um, hang on, my, hopefully that's working. Oh, cool. Hopefully that's working. <laughs> I'm just having trouble, fun with my tech here. Um, we've been trained to kill, haven't we? It's just ingrained in us. And, you know, when you think about it, we've got this reaction-based system where this started with cultivation and manually weed controlling weeds. It wasn't just herbicides, but I think it's become um, probably even more so because herbicides make it a bit simpler to kill than than hoeing things out with a hoe or manually removing, even cultivating. It's much quicker to spray weeds. But, you know, when we think about where herbicides particularly came about, it was through warfare and research in World War II, to my knowledge. I'm not a history expert. This is what I've learned. So hopefully I'm on the right track. But I know they were also used in the Vietnam War. So then we, we start to apply this kind of killing mentality to herbicides don't we like and we talk about weeds as in they're invading they're a threat look out and we call herbicides some quite interesting names like terminator or slogger or hammer you know so we really are reacting with this reaction of they're the enemy and we've got to kill them and it can take quite a bit to flick that switch in our brain um, but when I start to think into that, sometimes we do need to control a plant. You know, there's no denying that. But if we don't stop and consider the whole system, we sometimes have to think, how well is this working for us? You know, um, just having problems with my tech. You know, how well is it? it? It can work in some instances. It has a role. It, killing is a tool in our toolbox with weeds. But it also can create a lot of unintended consequences, you know, um, things like um, the fact that, like I said, we're spending billions of dollars on herbicides in Australia. The latest ABARE statistics state that weeds and pests together are costing farmers $5.3 billion a year in Australia alone, and 82% of those costs are related to herbicides and weed control. So it's pretty massive, and that's billions of dollars that, we're spending that's going out of our local economies into herbicides. So it's a, it's a pretty huge expense. And alongside that, you know, these unintended consequences are the time and energy that we spend controlling. Um, and, and the fact that we're still having a lot of herbicide resistance, we're not necessarily getting any 
you know, we're not getting rid of these plants. We just keep on perpetuatingly needing herbicides and control of weeds. So it's an interesting one. Some of those unintended consequences can be the unintended harm that we have on non-target organisms like bees, earthworms, soil biology, birds, and declining soil health. There's a lot of um, observational evidence, but also now more and more scientific evidence and research papers coming out, um, exploring all of those linkages and definitely finding that there's there's reasons to be um, questioning into the reliance we have and starting to look in other ways of dealing with this. So, um, yeah, and one of the ways is starting to understand more about these plants in question, which we're going to do today. Um, so what if, you know, and we all hear because we're all asking this question, what if there's so much more to weeds? Anyone who works with land on any scale at all, I think, has had this same experience where we work hard to get the land all neat and tidy, but it never stays that way. And plants and weeds and nature, everything just keeps growing and evolving. And then we go, we react by then working harder to keep things back under control and retidy up and keep the land as if we want it to look like. But no matter how we want it to look, nature often has other ideas and continues to put all these plants we call weeds and other things back there. <laughs> it also sometimes sends disturbances like fires, floods, droughts as well. Um, but we get, you know, whatever happens, we get stuck in a cycle of controlling and often killing a lot of plants that are wanting to grow. So it's an interesting time to stop and think, what if there is so much more? And that starts with, I think, first questioning into our own thinking. One of the biggest aspects is how are we looking at this problem? Um, I find the first step on this journey is often we start to look at um, how is there a nicer way to kill these plants than herbicides or this or that or something that won't hurt the soil that I still want to kill it. And then we start to evolve from that, you know, so becoming aware of our own thinking um, and a shift in our perspective. So, um, the power of a shift in perspective is incredible. One of the beautiful quotes I've read in, in a lot of the reading I've done was from Gwyn Jones, who's based in Queensland and I believe does a lot of work on this topic and has done for a long time. And his shift in perspective quote was, read the plants first before you read the herbicide labels. And I'm like, that's what we're here to do today. Um, not see the weeds as a sign we need a herbicide, but see the weeds as a sign that there's something going on here. Why is this plant here? What is it? doing what's its function and maybe how can I do it out of a job and how can I shift the system into a more productive direction um and we can also shifting perspectives on you know um how those weeds are telling the story of what's happening with the land and learning to listen to those you know soil health indications getting curious but it's really, really important, that power of focus. When we're dealing with weeds, I've noticed myself, the huge power focus has just in generally being out in a landscape. If I've been, I spent a lot of time in my 20s cotton chipping, <laughs> mostly on the, my, on my own family's farm at the time. Um, but, you know, you'd be out there chipping weeds all day. And because you'd been focusing on those plants, you see them everywhere. You walk down the road, you see the neighbours' paddocks, you see this weed will turn up everywhere you go, that power of focus. Um, and we can, you know, what we look at expands, what we see expands. So sometimes thinking about those it's not pretending those plants aren't there, but starting to focus on what you do want. And many of the farmers I've learned most from on this journey of curiosity and exploring weeds have often said they start to manage for what they do want rather than just constantly focus on what they don't want. So they really balance that out and intentionally start to look for soil health and look for other aspects to maintain that focus because that can really pull us undone when we start to look at different ways to look at weeds. Um, but these plants have some really interesting characteristics. They are, the plants we call weeds are very hardy, aren't they? They're resilient, they're nature's survivors. It doesn't matter what we throw at them sometimes, they just keep growing. They have this amazing ability to thrive in disturbed soils, really um, degraded areas, often with no care whatsoever. They, you know, despite our efforts to eradicate them often, um, a lot of these plants are more pioneering, they, you know, cover bare degraded soils. They come in and grow where often other plants are struggling to grow and they're there to hold the soil together. So they're really, you know, part of nature's repair system. They fill gaps in ecosystems. Nature doesn't generally create 
bare ground a lot you know specific particularly in areas where we do get reasonable rainfall and you know the minute there's bare ground these plants just seem to turn up when even you haven't seen them before if you've disturbed the soil you'll often get different plants turning up a lot of them have this amazing ability to open up compacted soils but they're also um, bringing you know restoring soil organic matter they're recycling nutrients and they're doing a lot of work a lot of these plants also a medicinal um, have you know traditional herbal medicine applications so they're a pretty interesting group of plants when we stop and think about what they're doing and what their characteristics are which all set themselves up for a lot of these indications um, but you know if we think about the role they play in the ecosystem they're cycling minerals you know they're bringing minerals up from the subsoil and bringing them back through the system they are breaking up soil compaction, often have deep tap roots. And some of them have, you know, depending on their role, they'll have different types of root systems that will support the job they're there to do. They cover the soil, they create, um, you know, they help us create and restore soil carbon and improve the soil. They, as I said, have those medicinal values, nutrition a lot of the time. Many of these plants, it depends on the context, but if they're edible, some of them have amazing levels of crude protein and nutrition for stock, um, and they provide ecosystem services. So, you know, pollen pollination, habitat for pollinators, birds. I was only watching some parrots the other day in my garden eating all the dandelions, um, you know, and I'm a bit worried they're also going to eat the fruit on my trees, but <laughs> they were there eating the dandelion flowers. And so, you know, all these plants are contributing to biodiversity and basically those ecological processes such as, like I said, the mineral cycling, successional dynamics, capturing solar energy and restoring the water cycle. So they do have a really important role to play as being part of the biodiversity in the system. But this, this whole concept I want to share before we go into some specifics is probably the one that taught me the most about understanding successional dynamics and ecological dynamics in, in nature and helped me start to see a lot more about what the weeds were telling me about the state of the land I was working in. Um, and this is that whole thing about plant successional processes called community dynamics, um, where when we start you know, if we start the process of soil formation back here at the beginning, we start on bare rock. And over time, the life that evolves on the planet moves from bare rock through to soil. And the first things that can grow on rock are things like the lichens and mosses. If you've got soil growing lichen and moss, you're very much likely back to subsoil. And that does happen a lot. Um, it, it means the soil is very much back to soil formation mode. We've lost a lot of the topsoil. Um, then as time goes on, you know, what happens over time was, you know, we're always evolving. Nature's always evolving to more complexity, more diversity, stability, and it's constantly, you know, using this process to build up over time. And it, it keeps on moving no matter what we do. You know, these plant early colonising plants come into this system once the lichens and mosses start photosynthesizing start binding things together we then get in plants with shallow root systems or more scrambling growth patterns that cover that soil and gradually over time more deeper rooted plants come through you know the soils gradually become more suitable for more advanced plants and these sort of processes are just going on all of the time um, it helps us to see when we start to understand where the weeds fit in the system often our weeds like this small annual um plants and lichens space here weeds are those pioneering plants that exist at these lower levels of succession not always but a lot of those annual weeds particularly and we'll look at some examples shortly um, where we want you know grasses and perennial grasslands to to live is a bit more of an advanced um, ecological community until we get up to those climax communities which are mostly forests and trees so when we start to think about where weeds fit they're a pretty good indication that we we've set our system back a fair way in agriculture most of the things we do unintentionally reverse this process that nature's trying to take us on and if you think about what happens if you were to take some land and just stop doing anything with it after that year a lot of plants will come up you know that we call weeds but sometimes if we leave it alone in the second year we see a different type of plant coming up um and and over time those plants 
create the conditions for something else to grow. Sometimes that can take a, a while. Sometimes it moves through quickly. It depends on the context. But eventually, left alone, that land will return to some form of forest and whatever is appropriate. Um, and it, it is just a matter of time. But nature's time frame is so much longer than ours, you know. So, But that's what we're working against. And weeds are part of that system. They're just coming in doing that sort of job, you know. Um, this is something also on the same dynamic, but there's also that soil biological successional process that happens. We see what was in the last slide above the ground, but below the ground, the soil biology is also transitioning transitioning through in the system. And that's also part of, you know, partnering with the plants that want to grow. So those really basic soils where weeds love to grow, where those annual pioneering plants come in are very bacterially dominated, where a perennial grassland's got more fungi in it, more balanced bacterial fungi ratio. And then as those um, communities evolve, we get more into the woody plants and um, sometimes the woody weeds sit in there, but I think they play, my observations, a few different roles. So with all of this don't ever try and make it just cut and dried. I look at things and I keep an open mind. And I think in some cases, the woody weeds are a slightly fungal soil. In some cases, they're a really um, sleepy, no, you know, area where there's not much grazing impact and needs livening up. So, you know, but they sit along a continuum, I guess. And, you know, we can think about what are our weeds telling us? They're also showing us what plants might grow easily and well in this system as we start to restore the health of that soil as well. So it's really interesting. Um, the other thing that I think we need to understand that some weeds are there because um, there's this decay process that happens in soils where organic materials break down and are part of that system. And sometimes there's a number of weeds that come up when that decay process is just not working. Um, and so, you know, thinking about they're there trying to stimulate a system so that the decay and the cycling of the organic matter and everything can start to flow again. Um, so that's part of the ecological aspects we're dealing with as well is decomposition. Um, but the big one I think that I've started to really understand more about as I curiously explore weeds is this germination signal. So if you think about like there's this huge seed bank in our soils, it's, it's amazing when you over time when you um, really restore a landscape and start to see it through different seasons and different natural disasters and different things that happen, you start to notice in some years something turns up, a plant just germinates that you might not have seen before. I know that certainly happened here after fire. We got weeds we'd never seen before. Um, and I think it's to do with this, the fact that seeds have this innate intelligence and they're waiting for the signals that happen in the environment which often are impacted by us before they germinate things you know they need um, conditions relying on soil temperature water some seeds it's depending on their exposure to light um, you know what's happening with regards to the nitrates in the soil and minerals in the soil ph all these things are going on and the soil biological communities in this in there are affecting these germination signals. Um, and our management or nature's disturbances send the signal for what seeds actually germinate and grow. So they're telling us a little bit once we start to understand them about what we're doing. Um, sometimes, you know, large seeded plants like weeds like nagura burr might disappear when people stop cultivating because they need, you know, they're not being buried by the, the, the ploughing. But some seeds with really small seeds, you know, um, they will only establish well when there's no tillage. So, you know, when we're minimum tilling, we might see different weeds coming up that like like sunlight to germinate or like those conditions. So partly what we're doing is often in favour of these plants, but they're really a sign that we're not utilising the solar energy, the moisture and the nutrients. And these plants are coming in to do that, you know, so they're really looking for that. When we were burnt in 2019, we live on a really light granite soil, um, very low CEC. It doesn't generally have a lot of nitrogen accumulating weeds because it's it, it is very low mineral status. And and we know it suddenly had this flush of nightshade 
weeds, which are a nitrogen accumulator, and they came up everywhere, which is in 15 years, we'd never seen a plant. So imagine how long these seeds stay in soils for. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, and they were to us, they taught us that the soil um, biology, it, it had been a major drought, major fire event, it was pretty apocalyptic at the time. And they were assigned for us that the soil bacteria had died off in the system and there was nothing to take um, soak up that the protozoa had long gone, the soil food web had been disrupted and all these free nitrogens, nitrogen was sort of floating around in the soil, free nitrate that normally would be taken up by plants and cycled through biology. Within the lack of that, the nitrate accumulating weeds turned up and they started cycling that back through the system. And it was really interesting. That was our interpretation of that experience. They Obviously, that's, those weeds can turn up in different places, but in our context, we could see how that was related to so many aspects, I guess. It's just another example of that germination signal hadn't been there in 15 years, but suddenly the conditions were right for that plant. Um, and I guess, you know, if we start to think about it, this is a beautifully simple list of six reasons weeds grow. It's from Nicole Master's book, For the Love of Soil, where there's a chapter on weeds with some really great information on all of these topics. But those six main reasons weeds grow summed up really well by Nicole. And it is to either colonise bare soil, to come in when there's low soil organic matter, open up compaction, deal with a mineral imbalance, a bit like I said with the nitrate, after the fire, um, deal with microbial imbalances, which I also think contributed in that nitrogen accumulation with the nightshade, but also as a safety valve for toxins. I mean, milk thistles are a classic plant I've seen. I've seen it come up in places where it might not have been present before once they've been sprayed with a herbicide and it's coming in to um, detoxify the soil. And it's really interesting. I've seen it turning up like that in a few contexts now and as a herbal remedy it's also a detoxifier so it's interesting the correlation where it seems to be triggered to turn up after a herbicide application like I said in systems where I've not seen it growing before that application so um, yeah start to notice and start to observe what you see in your context but if we think about some weeds, like I'm just going to give you a few examples. There's a few classic weeds that turn up when the calcium's low and there's low humus and organic matter. And, and when you think about calcium function in your soil, some soils have the calcium, but it's not biologically active. It's not functional. And that's because calcium function is driven by water and, and fungi. And, you know, often there's weeds, as we saw in those successional diagrams, often weeds are indicating there's a breakdown in soil fungi networks. Um, these are things like thistles, balthus burrs, castor oils, patty melons. Um, there's a lot of linkages with calcium and weeds, um, quite a lot. And I often see thistles also um, they come up after places have been overgrazed in drought. I've observed that a few times as well. They seem to be like prickly plant. It's needing some ground cover. It's needing a rest in, in is what I'm observing. But they also indicate calcium function. Compactions are another reason there's a lot of plants coming in to assist because the soil's compacted. Classics are dock, bathyspurs, thistles, like I said, often a case. Rushes and sedges too, particularly if there's been water logging and the soil's just got no air, um, they are classics for compaction. Um, and then broadleaf weeds love high potassium, low phosphorus conditions. And the classic, this one, this photo is fleabane. It's a bit of a classic, but, you know, broadleafs in general could be indicating that. And you might notice some weeds could have a few themes. It's really up to you to think about your context. Why is it showing up? It might cross over. I think I can just hear someone might not be muted. There's a bit of background noise. So just check your microphones off, folks. <laughs> um and then other weeds are not high nitrate accumulators. Like I talked about the nightshade was in our, our context, but, you know, things like nettles, fat hen, milk thistle can also be that. Um, cape weed's another nitrate accumulator. Um, you know, things that I, I see there as a few reasons they're there, but it often indicates to me a fairly bacterial soil with maybe a not a lot of higher order Part, members of the soil food web thriving, you know, protozoa um, might be lower in and things like that. So, yeah, just thinking about they're here to soak up nitrates, they're here trying to rebalance that, that mineral in the system. 
and bare soils as well. Like, you know, we've all created bare soil at some point in time and it hasn't stayed bare for long generally, <laughs> unless we're in a thick of a drought or a fire. But there's nature has plants that just come in to protect the soil. Classics are, um, this one's got a cat head burr, which I'm familiar with from west of out here, bindweed, purslane, um, you know, things like that, shallow rooted annual grasses, like you'll start to notice. I know in our context, we see purslane come up the minute there's some bare ground, um, particularly in summer. It's really just seems to turn up instantly where you've never seen any sign of it before, but it's there healing, binding that soil back together. And then there's something that um, this term fungal sleepy soils, I think I adopted from working with Nicole Masters, but it's a, it's a sign that this, for me that stock i'm observing in the field this happening when stock density is low and the soils are really not getting any disturbance they might not be getting that impact from grazing animals um and in come the woody weeds blackberries are a classic um sometimes mimosa bush west of here those um malines another one mullen you might just pronounce it either way bracken um anything prickly and they tend to grow around fence lines, rocky outcrops, and I guess it, there may be other contexts, but mostly I see the, the common theme I've noticed with all of these is that there hasn't been a high intensity grazing system. And so the soil does get a bit, it isn't that biologically active. Um, so yeah, that's another sort of trend I've noticed with those guys. And really bacterial soils, if you think about the classic with these type of soils is when soils are really early in that soil formation stage. Think if you go to the beach, start to look at the plants growing on the edge of the sand dunes. They're often these types of grasses trying to bind all that loose sand together to create soil. Um, Kaikuyu, Johnson's grass, cooch, are rare, often, you know, pretty low biological activity indications there. And they sort of keep it static at that a bit too, the, the Kaikuyu and cooch. I find them quite hard to move on at a lot, much longer time frame than I have patients sometimes. <laughs> There's also some weeds that do not need mycorrhizal fungi. Brassic is a classic. They, you know, um, the things like um, uh, fat hen is another one or lamb's quarters, depending on what you call it. Also non-mycorrhizal, the sedges, the brassicas. So these plants can really thrive in those um, really bacterial systems and a good indication, particularly brassicas, that you're in a pretty bacterially dominated soil. There's a few other weeds that I equate to grazing management. Now, there's always a lot of factors that are at place. It's never just one, but this seems to be a pretty common theme. I see with some of those more invasive grasses like African love grass, Chilean needle grass, Kulatai grass are the big three up here. Um, and I know they're across a few different contexts, but when I've seen those weeds become problematic, it is often grazing. It, and often when I've seen people start to reverse their hold on country, they do it through grazing management. And it's not a quick fix, but it, over time I've seen lots of people starting to make inroads with these plants um, through graze, good grazing management and you know adequate rest and recovery. But it's, it is um, commitment to that practice over time that makes a difference. And if you think about grazing management, um, there's one really cool way to understand it, and this slide often helps me explain it, is if we're um, grazing, overgrazing a pasture and the palatable, because those grasses aren't that palatable to stock, they're not going to, there's times they're more palatable than others, but once they get to that flowering stage, they're not, they're not really wanting to eat them. So they get a head start. They end up you know, thriving in the system where all the palatable grasses end up like this plant on the diagram, that 90% of it's eaten down, it loses vitality because the animals just keep hammering all of the desirable species, opening the door to the less desirable species. And that's where that managed grazing to manage the impact on the desirable species and allow them to rest, recover from grazing can is the only way to either prevent that that becoming worse or also to reverse the trend. And it's much easier to prevent it than it is to reverse it. Um, but think about your grazing management. Think about what those animals are selecting when they come into the system because they will leave those grasses alone, giving them a head start over everything you want to grow. Um, so that's where, you know, starting to learn how to apply grazing man management principles in your own context can be really supportive with some of those really tricky invasive grasses. Um, 
So that's, I've done pretty well in getting through that. I thought I could take longer. I hope I'm not talking too quickly for you all. Um, but yeah, if you think about what alternatives do we have? Like if, you know, we can, all of the, all the methods are tools in the toolbox, but once we start to understand the role these plants are playing, we actually open the door to a more holistic approach, don't we? We start to think about firstly looking at soil health because soil health is is contributing to these issues. How can we um, start to look at ways we can restore that health? Can we use some cover crops to help tailor the system and, and build a healthier soil? A lot of the time, if you start to use those plants that are growing, what nature's got growing there, the ones we call weeds, as a little bit of an indication into what your soil health is telling you, you can choose plants that will do well in a in a multi-species cover crop that might also help take those roles out of the system from the weeds and give you some other way to achieve it that might be more nutritious for stock or whatever it is, you know. Um, I also read recently about a farmer in uh, was it a farmer in the United States and he was talking about his observations that when he he noticed that he was missing two of the soil health principles in his management he would open the door to weeds so those soil health principles were things like keeping ground cover there minimizing disturbance having a diversity of plants um and that kind of thing and the more you know, more of those that were missing the more problems he was having. And I thought that was a really interesting um, observation. But, you know, there's more and more happening with can I slash those plants um, and let them do their job and slash them before they go to seed? Can I use, um, you know, compost and things to help boost the soil biological health? Grazing management's huge in grazing systems. In cropping systems, it is a bit more challenging to shift things on. It's a totally different system, but it is possible and there are farmers making headway on that. Um, you know, things like crop rotation, pasture lays, some people making weed teas even, and there's also a lot of people buffering herbicides, starting by just buffering those herbicides with carbon sources to get a better uptake, use a bit less of the chemical and help it to break down in the system. Um, and it's also, you know, just feeding the system as well. But I think it's to start to think about, you know, once we get under the hood of why that's there, we can start to take that whole system's view of where do we approach it and which tool in the toolbox is most appropriate in this in this in situation. Um, 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 so I wanted to show a few photos of what has happened, what I've seen happen when we leave weeds alone. Now, these are from grazing systems. Um, but this was a client's property where we did some soil monitoring and we had a pretty good flea, vein, flea bane infestation in 2019. And it's interesting because we also took some soil tests in that paddock and it, the soil was really high in potassium, which was is often linked to flea bane. So it really confirmed that. Um, we did some monitoring at the time that, you know, there was a bit of concern. Look at all these seeds. Like there's a lot of seeds on a flea bane plant. I think 100,000 seeds. It's a lot. What are we going to do? Are we in trouble here if we leave it alone? Um, we actually did some monitoring and we um, sort of were able to, using a, a little technique called the step point, where we were able to get, put a percentage on how much was flea bane and how much was grass. So in case it came back next year, we could see if it was worse or better because you can, you can look at it and not remember. So always take a photo of an area um, and take, start taking photos of your weeds because then you've got something to come back to. You can also put some data around it in the field when you're monitoring. Um, but in a year's time, there was no flea bane and it's a classic. It will come in a grazing system and go. It's a bit harder in a cropping system to deal with flea bane because we're actually creating the perfect conditions for it to thrive and it is beginning quite resistant to herbicides. But um, in a grazing system, it seems to come in beautiful deep taproot to help break up the soil and cycle minerals and soak up all that potassium and then it moves on. And we saw this again in our own property in January 2021. Um, this was after our property was recovering from fire and drought. Um, we were wall to wall flea bane. And I was pretty confident from what I'd been watching on other people's grazing properties that it would go. And a year later, it was gone. And so sometimes, but again, I took the photos because I wanted to have a record, you know, just to see the progression of that plant. So, you know, sometimes it is, if you're not game to let something go on a huge area, just start somewhere small and learn and gain confidence with your own context because 
no two properties are alike, no two seasons are alike, no two soils are, you know, like we've got to start to explore this on a small scale sometimes to really feel into it. But just to show you what's possible, I guess. Um, and I guess I want to leave you today with a bit of a process for listening more to the weeds that you've got, okay? This is something you can um, come back to. But the first thing is observe the the plant characteristics of that plant you know dig it up have a look at the plant what's the tap what's the root system look like what's this plant doing just start to get really curious about it if you're using a refractometer you might take a bricks reading to get a bit of an insight is it happier than the plants i want or not you know what's my management creating the best conditions for the weed or the plants the pastures or the crops i'm trying to grow um also what i would suggest is you start to observe and monitor the soil health in a field where you're dealing with weed issues uh, that's i can't overemphasize this enough soil health is so important you know diagnose the soil constraints you've got dig a hole have a look at the compaction is there compaction issues what's the soil structure like um, consider soil testing if that's appropriate as well but most important is that physical soil health that's more important than anything else starting to observe and monitor the physical health of your soil that's also going to help you understand what's triggering those plants to turn up what are they here helping me to do because it's hard to say that one plant's doing the same thing in everyone's context you know also think about the history of that paddock what's been happening there before has there been overgrazing? Has it been a sacrifice paddock in a drought? Has it a history, a long history of cultivation or a long history of herbicidal, fall you know, fallows? What crop rotations or, you know, different pasture species have been there in the past? What's the fertiliser history? Like start to think and consider what could these plants be telling me about what's happened before now? The next thing I like to do is really research the plant. I get online. There's some great information on, you know, weeds online. Um, government agencies have really good information on the weeds and they always include the types of areas those plants like to grow. You know, they, they often say they grow in undisturbed soils or they love roadsides or they love these conditions. You can find a lot just generally researching the plant. Um, there's also some really good books that you can read on weeds as indicators. There's, I have um, a, a whole list of them in the little a little booklet I can send through for people who've registered to download and start their own library. A lot of them have got a good Australian one now, but a lot of them are sort of American based and I'd have to kind of find the plant and the scientific names to kind of really get into it. But they really help you start to see the trends that I've just discussed before as well. So do a bit of research, do a bit of digging. Don't take it as cut and dry. Just go, could that be what it's doing here? Like stay curious with it. Um, and consider those six reasons that weeds grow. Like what is it telling us in relation to this plant? What role could it be fulfilling in this system? There's also those ecological processes that we spoke about, mineral cycling, successional dynamics, solar energy capture, it's, it's there photosynthesising. Um, the water cycle, what's it doing in relation to all of those things? Keep those in your mind because those plants are part of those ecological processes. Um, and do monitor over time. You know, take some great photos, take, pay attention to where you take the photos so that you can see it's the same spot over time. You can do some, you know, learn some other monitoring techniques that you can use to keep an eye on those weed populations um, because monitoring helps us manage our mindset. It is hard to sometimes sometimes we see a weed, one weed and we think we've got a massive problem and it actually isn't as bad as we think and having that over time can be hard to be subjective over that's why data can be really helpful and it doesn't have to take a long time to collect it it is just taking some good photos and keeping some good records um, to see how you're going over time and learn I think just if you've got a place that's safe to play on a little bit on your property over time you'll start to learn about the successional dynamics on your landscape and learn Learn more about what these plants are telling you in your context it, it is really important that you do that um, and also if you want to dig a bit deeper you can also take a leaf test and that will tell you if a plant's accumulating a specific mineral as well um, so that's you know it's not necessary but it can sometimes add a dimension to this if you've really really struggling to figure out what this plant's doing um, that can be really helpful and I think just keep an open mind you know um, remember that context is everything I've said that a lot today but you know there's no one size fits all it is really about 
trying different things in your context and um yeah and staying curious and flexible with your approaches I think um so that's given us a bit of time for some questions at the end um I might stop just sharing my screen if I can get my computer to work so I can see you all I'm impressed I managed to do that on time. <laughs> you have done such a good job. <laughs> like I said, I could talk all day on this. So I was just like, I've got to keep it to the point. <laughs> and I could listen all day. So <laughs> everyone was saying all day. No. Um, but if, if people are comfortable with turning their um, cameras on, please do. Um, if you want to ask a question, just unmute yourself and, and ask away. Um, just Kim, why you're probably taking a little break and, and having a drink there. Um, thank you so much for all that information. Um, I, I'm super excited about, you know, the, uh, what you sort of presented today because we had our um, ACT grazing group on Wednesday and a lot of these topics came up and the answers that we were giving are exactly in line with what you just said. Yeah, yeah. I think we're on the right track. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I'm a massive advocate for photo point monitoring, um, you yes. know, for all sorts of reasons in life, you know, like if you're on the farm, just any gate or any particular mm -hmm. feature that you know is going to be there all the time, a tree or a, or a strainer post or a, um, power lines or something like that. We've all got smartphones now. You just snap a photo every time you go through and you store it away in your phone, in a folder, and it's there every 12 months sort of thing. So, you know, thanks for um, mentioning that as well. But we've got Andrew Davidson with his hand up if you want oh, to hello, Andrew. ask your question. Yeah, Kim. <laughs> I'm good. Andrew's not that far from me. <laughs> no, no, just a stone's throw, and we've been through a fairly similar uh, firestorm 12 months ago. Uh, we got yeah. fully burnt out. Um, and yeah, I'd sort of echo the same sentiments, particularly with the the flea bane um, mm. post drought. And then uh, we haven't had it post fire this time, but um, we had uh, stinking Roger was there, big one post fire. Wow. And it actually uh, in our hill country, it did a really good job of, I think, uh, holding the soil together and providing some shade and shelter for the recovering grasses, which have come back really well post fire. Mm. Uh, so that was quite interesting watching that. But interested in your thoughts on fireweed and um, and some options for it because it's um, we've got a lot of fireweed coming in from the eastern side across the top now. Uh, mm, mm, mm. It's one I'm I don't play with it a lot, but every time I go down the coast, I, I come up against fireweed, and I think it's that bacterial soil calcium processes. Yeah, yep. fair that it's just filling a space in that system in that yeah bacterial system is my yep. knowledge of it. What I don't know if you would feel that's relevant. Um, like I think um, I think um, ground cover is obviously a piece of the the jigsaw puzzle, mm -hmm. but given you were saying KQ is indicative of bacterial. Um, I'm also seeing it um, in thinking through in a lot of the coastal stuff. It's in Kaikuyu pastures mm -hmm. that have been sort of set stocked. And yeah. Yeah, we get in some of the, the Kaikuyu clumps as well. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I think grazing management is such an important tool for mm. a lot of these plants for me, and it really does shift things over time. But it's not a mm. quick fix. Not a quick fix, but yeah, for me. Of where I've seen it most, the great grazing management hasn't, it's been more set stocked. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And Kaikyu is one of those weeds. It'll grow anywhere, but gee, it, it'll handle it the toughest soil you can throw at it too. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So we've got that lovely mix um, of currently where we don't have Kaikyu, we've got love grass. So yeah. 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 working back from that. Yeah. Um, Andrew, um, just uh, the, the observation around uh, fireweed being a daisy, um, the senecios, is that it, it's it's a um, species which prefers um, high phosphor, uh, high potassium um, in the in the chemistry of the soil, and so it has it, it that's that's the stimulant. Um, the, so the biology which are associated with um, high potassium, um, like free potassium, yep. uh, particularly after fire. Um, is where that um, that really that really takes off, and it go, it does go through a succession 
Um, yep. And the daisies, the daisies are part of a succession um, process. Mm -hmm. And um, so it, it, it's not something which stays forever. Um, and then it'll pop up in different areas um, according to the high potassium. Mm. So, but all the, the daisy the daisy pioneers are um, are potassium, and that's why the flea bane um, yeah. is a, an immediate um, quick come up, and um, uh, yeah. So that's that's the that's the usual um, thing to be looking at, and so um, where there's free potassium, um, more more soluble potassium, that's where the the microbes um, specific to um, Senecio, um they really. They really make it make the environment perfect for them to germinate. Mm, that's really helpful, Jared. Thank you. Because so, like, I'm, we're all just learning on this journey, aren't we? And the more we share these observations, the more we can we can all put the pe puzzle pieces together in our own context. Mm. Yeah, you you'll see where sheep have um, <clears throat> have been congregating and. Um, and you bear off your soil. You, you quite quite often you find um, daisy species such as capeweed yeah. that that comes up and um, and uh, quickly colonises. Um, and and then you know there's a biological action that that daisy plant because they such a, uh, incredibly prolific seeders. They throw as much seed out as possible, knowing that um, the succession is going to move them out of the out of the way eventually. And mm. but that seed will sit in the soil, and and the, all of the compositae family, um, the seed is very long lived. So it it um, it just sits and waits for a um, an opportunity to 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 just go nuts again. It's um, like when there's when the it's like they're waiting to help when they need it again, isn't it? Like they're just sitting there. These seeds mm -hmm. are just waiting. Yeah, mm -hmm. fascinating. It's a triage system and they're there it is. ready to go when you walk into the emergency. <laughs> Not that we thought we needed them, but, you know. Yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah, that's I'm right. Also, yeah. feel free to raise your hand if you have any more questions. I'm looking at some of the um, definitions of weeds in the chat and now I can see them. Early succession plants, that's a pretty cool way to look at them. Something growing I didn't have to plant. <laughs> Friend or foe, Jenny. Um, nature's best biological option to repair landscape dysfunction, usually a pioneer. That's a great way to to find it jared um oh and this someone's popped another looks look like a book solutions read the weed that's one i haven't got gee that could look that looks really quite good too um just got two yeah. questions at the end of the chat there and then andrew i think you've got another question oh. Oh, and anna so um maybe kim do you want to um if you can see nathan's question in the chat yeah i'm just working my way what are the key physical soil tests you recommend to carry out for me it's the a basic soil health monitoring um you can use the rapid assessment of soil health manual that david hardwick's got it's a great way but um just making sure you're monitoring soil physical health with soil structure you know digging a hole taking a photo of your soil profile at at least a shovel depth you don't need to do a whole soil pit like a lot of people think i'm going to come out dig a soil pit no i'm just going to use a shovel dig a hole have a look for compaction um looking at water infiltration rates identifying um you know ground cover but basically that soil physical health there's some really great manuals you can do and you can give your soil a score but you're also just having a look for compaction soil structural issues um yeah, I, when I worked with Integrity Soils, we used to use the Visual Soil Assessment Manual, which I know a lot of people in Victoria have used before. Um, prior to that, working in New South Wales, I liked the the Rapid Assessment of Soil Health Manual. Um, but, yeah, just choose an option that works for you and stick with it. And the more you monitor your soil, the better you get. It's like you don't you learn to do it by doing it and everyone feels a bit um unconfident at first that's why you take photos and like you said jenny the photo points are essential um because even if you got a calibrator over time you'll get better at it the more you do it your photos are going to be able to ground truth it and having that story is really powerful um i hope that helps yeah um we might just, uh, a few questions are coming through, but I said we would answer Amanda from Mid Lachlan Landcare and then we'll go Andrew and Anna and we'll see how we go for time. I'm curious to know, like after the, um, listening like heliotrope, 
Lantana, we're all going to, everyone's going to have a different plant in question. But if we to think about some of those principles that we were talking about and the reasons weeds grow, is it colonising their soil? Is it low soil organic matter? Is it compacted? Is there a mineral imbalance? Well, that you might not know just from looking at it, but some of these plants might tell you that. Is it microbial? Is it a safety valve? Like for me, my I have a lot of these weeds and a resource on my computer that I can jog my memory on them, but I've in the field, go out and have a look at it and think about your grazing management. Think about is there is there bare ground? Um, yeah, and just go into it because for me to access the hundreds of plants just off the top of my head <laughs> it's quite challenging um and you're all throwing different ones at me i think lantana is one that comes up a lot down the coast um and it it's complex it's also a woody weed so think about the plant successional dynamics heliotrope might be more a bacterial soil indicator but there's going to be many many reasons those plants are happy at your place not just one so I can just encourage you to go and have a look at them. Um, and I think here, compacted, bare soil, non-palatable. Yeah, yeah, you can see. Um, they're all just trying to move that system so that other plants can grow and come in. And they're all working together. Like, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, like you were talking about the daisies, Jared, they're just going to wait there till they're needed again. I think a lot of these plants are just trying to move that system across in that successional state. Yeah. Um, so sorry if I'm not being really prescriptive, but it's just there's so many different plants for me to get off the top of my head yeah. after talking for an hour. <laughs> Andrew, have you um, have you got another um, question? Yeah. So it's a uh, one for the Brains Trust. Um, post post the 2019-20 uh, bushfires on the Northern Tablelands, I saw a lot of our native grass species express themselves in a significantly larger state in areas that weren't burnt. So we're talking microlina up over the handlebars of the, the motorbike kangaroo grass chest high. Um, it actually took us a bit to actually identify the microlina because it was just looking uh, so not like we're used to. And I'd just, interesting enough, if anyone's got any ideas why it was expressing itself in such a large form, uh, because that certainly made a huge amount of high quality feed in those species. Mm. And yeah, I, that, like that's I a stimulant. Like, that, yeah, that's been stimulated. Uh, we had the same thing here in East Gippsland, where mm. um, where the microlina really went off after the fires, um, and um, so it, it's a it's a reaction to the um, the change in uh, in nutrient. So there's also in smoke. There is, um, there is, you know, because we had so much ash and smoke, that also stimulates the biology and um, stimulates the, you know, this um, this dropping of uh, of nutrients, including nitrogen. Um, but I think that there was some relationship between the biology of the soil that particularly um, was would would stimulate microlina. Um, it was incredible with the seed, the amount of seed that um, came off the microlina was just absolutely phenomenal. And uh, and now uh, the succession's kind of moved and microlina is there again, but it's just, it's kind of back in context. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that it was an opportunity for it to just drop its seed. And it makes me, um, it makes me think around um, cultural burning um, because microlina was a um, was a, one of the staple um, grains that was used by uh, many different nations, and um, it makes me think about um, this kind of movement of um, of cultural burning um, and smoke and ash moving through the landscape. Whether that was also you know that's something which has been an evolution over um, however many years um, of of cultural management. Awesome. It's really interesting, isn't it? Yeah, and it is. Yeah. Nature has got a lot to teach us if we can just start to listen to it, hasn't it? And that's the whole point, I think. Um, you know, we can get prescriptive about this plant's doing this and this, but everyone's context is different too. And they're going to act differently in different times and different seasons and be responding. They're complex just like we are. They're going to be responding to the complexity. Um, and, and think about Calcium fungi, it's a huge one in many, many different types of weeds, but also grazing management and bare ground are the biggest ones I see for most of the plants we don't want. <laughs> um, and, yeah, watching those nature's disturbances, creating those different successional processes. Um, 
Yeah, I hope that's helpful. Like I said, I don't want to be too prescriptive because I don't know your context, but come back to the six reasons weeds grow. And I will send you the resource, Jenny, to email out to everyone who's registered that I've yep. got as a bit of a summary of these topics and some good books in it as well. So you can keep exploring, keep being Fantastic. curious. Yeah, mm. that's great. Yeah, thank you so much, Kim. I um, I just wonder whether we start working with some of those chemical companies and start branding their um. There are uh, chemicals, something a little bit sympathetic to the soils rather than, you know, crusher and the exterminator. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's really interesting, isn't it? And mm-hmm. when I started exploring, because I've, I've killed my own fair share of weeds in my life as well, and that's what taught me, I think, and helped me to start to see the patterns as well, is we've all, you know, when we know better, we can do differently. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But that's to say those tools are in our toolbox. It's just trying to balance out the choice of tools to the situation and the context we're in, yeah. 100%. And I wanted to say thank you to do, to you for your time today. We've all now got more tools in our toolbox and uh, we can go outside and start talking to the paddocks and the weeds a little bit more friendly. Um, thank you very much to everyone who joined us online this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you're coming from. Uh, we will email you out the recording. Um, if you've got further questions that you didn't get a chance to ask, then I've just put the ACT Landcare, uh, Landcare at actgov.au email address um, or you've all probably got mine at some stage because I sent you out a reminder this morning happy to receive questions anywhere um, and yeah we'll send that recording out and everything anything else that sort of goes with it but thank you very much Kim thank you Jared thank you Mary thank you to everyone who asked questions and and everyone who was here and enjoy the rest of your afternoon and stay safe thank you thanks Jenny thanks Kim thanks, guys thank you. great see you all bye try to turn this um recording <laughs> there it is stop recording got it good job well done jared thanks for being the recording expert Great. <laughs>